Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. Today, we're going to talk about the three pillars of crisis leadership and how to communicate them in order to secure more personal and organizational competitive challenges, uh, excuse me, competitive advantages in this era of, let's face it, constant crisis, whether it is weather and getting 12 feet dumped on parts of California that aren't used to it or wars overseas or failures of various financial institutions. There's a lot of stuff going on. And here's the kicker. It's not just now. There's always something. So when you are the leader, how do you navigate it? Not just what do you do, but how do you communicate it in a way that reinforces that sense of, of security and trust in others and helps with those competitive advantages. To talk about this today, I'm bringing on my guest, Damon Diamore. And Damon has spent more than 30 years working directly with Fortune 500 C-suite leaders, focusing on three main pillars, psychological performance, crisis leadership, and storytelling for stakeholders, helping leaders to gain advocacy by communicating their unique value. And uh, he's built international business units for leading Wall Street firms, produced high-profile television programs for Hollywood, and worked in venture and corporate innovation. So, Damon, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's always great to see you. Now, share with us a little bit of a fun fact first. Fun fact was one of the great uh, experiences I had working in in Hollywood and media was producing Undercover Boss, being one of the producers and uh, integral in the casting process for the first two seasons, interviewing I don't know, a couple hundred CEOs and CMOs to be on the show and, you know, digging down into the nitty gritty of the stuff that they never tell anybody. You know, so many times I'd walk out of the room after three hours of, you know, emotionally draining interview process and their PR person would say, I've been here for a decade. I've never heard that story. So, <laughs> you know, people just love to open up and tell me everything. And what is the, and hopefully you're going to open up and tell us everything today, but what's one of the wackiest stories that you ever didn't expect to hear? Oh, man. Well, if you know the nature of the show, just to, to be brief about it, you know, um, it was a great show. I saw a whole bunch of episodes, but uh, go ahead, tell for anybody else who hadn't so, been on it or hadn't seen yeah, it. So you put the CEO or the CMO on the front line of a business undercover where people don't know who they are. And in order to create an emotional connection, you find something deep in their past that without dropping it in conversation is going to come up naturally over the course of getting to know these people. So it could be that they were in long term recovery. It could be that, you know, a family member died of cancer. It could be that you know, it could be a whole range of of things, but usually at some point in the break room after five hours together on the line of whatever business it was, picking up trash or flipping burgers, um, you talk about your history and there's this common bond between them, either trauma linked or, or overcoming challenges and resilience. And then that brought out the more humane side. You know, the most common feedback for years was, I love that show. I can't believe they're so human. It's like, well, they're not robots because they're the CEO of a big company, but they all have messed up family problems and struggles to overcome. Um, they just, you know, have more responsibility and a higher profile. So the the premise of the show, from what I understood as a as a watcher, was that a the leader, the CEO, or whoever wanted to understand why certain either branches weren't fa were failing or where there were other problems in whatever you know production or shipping or customer service or why there was a problem in the business. So they would go undercover to pose as a new employee, to pose as uh, whatever other kind of role to get the inside scoop, knowing that as the CEO, nobody would just fess up to their face, so to speak. To really get transparent, unvarnished, non-biased feedback because, and that's one of the reasons why my clients hire me, they're surrounded by people who all have a stake in their success, whether it's their job, their stock price, whatever it might be. So it's very hard to get totally non-biased feedback from people who want to make sure that you're okay so that you keep you know, operating at the level that they want you to operate. But sometimes you need a cold bucket of water splashed on your face and be like, yo, bro, this is reality you know this is what's going on and um and uh and that's one of the key things that the show was able to take these ceos out of their black tower and say oh you know we're, we got four line items in that plant in arkansas we can cut one off it's like well you're gonna go work on the line now and see how hard it is with three people instead of four and why you know th that doesn't make sense and really a way for them to get unvarnished uh feedback and and create a, a better culture because that was a time when you know at the end of 08 
economy crashed, people hated CEOs, people were losing their houses while, you know, mortgage bankers took home record, you know, bonuses. And uh, it was a way of bridging the gap between the executive suite and and the man or woman on the front line. It was really successful in doing that. And for a lot of brands, especially big franchises, you go to a big franchisee meeting once a year in some stadium, you really don't have any degree of empathy from those folks about you. But when they see you taking out trash, driving routes all night long, you know, doing whatever it might be, it's like, oh, our our guy understands or our gal understands what we're going through. And it makes it easier to open up a bridge of communication because they feel like they will be heard and understood as opposed to, I'm telling you what's going on on a plant floor, but you're a Harvard MBA working on the 80th floor of a tower. You have no idea. This was a way to, to, to bridge those gaps of both expectations and perspectives. They were fabulous stories. So highly recommend it if there's, uh, I don't, I'm sure it's streaming somewhere on something. It's now everywhere. It's on CNBC there. reruns like every night after like eight o'clock or something. Oh, nice. All right. So there you go, everybody. Uh, after you listen to our podcast episodes, of course, go on and uh, tune in for some really fascinating human stories of, of business. Um, all right. So with that, now, let, instead of talking about their business, Damon, tell me a little bit about yours. What's your 30 second elevator pitch? Sure. My 30 second elevator pitch is that Legacy Mentor is a company that advises C-suite executives on the areas of performance, as you mentioned, navigating ambiguity and crisis, and how to tell their story to stakeholders in the most effective way. The thesis is that the world changed massively after 2020 in a way that um, I call a new a new zero, not a new normal, and that everybody's worldview changed and they know how it was different before and after a certain event. 9-11, JFK, whatever it might be. So the most important thing that I help people frame is how are they performing? Are they honestly measuring and accounting for their performance? And are they focused on approving performance and not just some specific outcome? When it comes to stakeholders, do you actually know who your stakeholders are and what they want and need? Um, do you know the most effective way to communicate to them, which is one of the things that you help people do? Um, do I know and can I clearly state my unique value to these people? And do I have the right data to support that as a consistent story over time? And then once you have all of that, are you confident in your ability to lead in a climate of complete ambiguity and unknowns and not only yourself be confident, but instill confidence in the people that you need to advocate and engage for you? And as a side note, more than half of my clients are women in the C-suite. So specifically for those clients, how have the traits and roles and skill sets for women in leadership changed post-2020? And what do they need to go forward in this environment to really survive and, and thrive? Okay, so that's a whole mouthful of stuff, and we're going to disaggregate a lot of it. Uh, but I want to really break down the three pillars that you mentioned. And let's, in particular, the one on narrative and storytelling. But let's take a quick look at the other ones just as context, uh, because it is sort of the three legs of the stool. The first one is about performance. So real quick, tell us what the performance is. Sure. I am a big on performance training and performance coaching, not outcome-based coaching. And Pat McNamara talks a lot about this on, on his blog and vlog on YouTube. And it's about measuring your consistency, having the right process in place that you're constantly iterating and updating and being present, that there is no secret. You're not going to have some secret journal or mantra or meditation zone or read a book that's going to change your whole perspective and make you clear and calm. Um, you know, getting control of your mindset, stopping your fear loop in a crisis, knowing that as an as your own identity that you are enough, that you are you have all the skills you need in order to succeed. You just don't have the proper mindset in order to take them. Uh, you know, from a clarity standpoint, having emotional relief, um, remembering every day there's a world out there that's telling you who you are, and there's a world inside of you. Which one are you going to listen to? And really being present about this stuff, and. People tend to freak out in crises, which is normal, but the ones that let the freak out go extended is because they start to blame everything externally. They're not focusing on what they can control. And I always tell people, don't hate the game, love the game because you're playing the game. As long as you still have your job, you're in the game every day. So accept the rules because you can change them and focus on what you can control, your your perception of events, and then how you react emotionally and tactically to those. Um, and that's essentially, you know, it deals with crisis mindset, identity, imposter syndrome, tactical things like time management and productivity and uh, essentialism, creating filters for what matters most so that you can put all the other stuff aside and not have a, a scarcity mindset, going from a reactive mindset and a reactive leadership style to a proactive leadership style. All that's under one big pillar of performance. And, in, and the most important part is once we get the tactical things down, 
building resilience as a real lifestyle, not as a tool that you break in a case of emergency and say, I need to be resilient now. It's about literally changing your worldview, being comfortable with ambiguity and seeing things for what they really are. And that's so resilience. And I think it's important that we talked about uh, per, that we defined it because when people think about performance, they do typically think about outcome, about results, about uh, did you it, you you set out to achieve X? Did you meet that goal or did you underperform, as in not reach it? So when you're looking at it more in terms of the mindset and your the balance of focusing on what is internal to you and what you do have control over versus what's external and what you don't have control over and accepting that and going from there it's a it's it's a very different framing and even in the framework of our 30 minute conversation right you have to have a strategy because that's what you're selling to your board your investors your customers whatever it might be and that's the outcome that you're focusing on down the line quarterly annually whatever it might be but day to day you need to focus on consistency, process, and presence. And Pat McNamara also has a great uh, motto where he says, you should be able to kill your clone every day. Tomorrow, what does that mean, kill your clone that, every day? So if I clone myself and tomorrow morning I bumped into myself when I start my work day, am I a little bit smarter, a little bit more resilient, are my skill sets a little bit more honed, am I stronger, and could I take down Damon from March 22nd on March 23rd. So small improvements over time lead to compounded results. And it's just a little bit, but you should be stronger every day, whether it's in your mindset, your communication skills, whether it's in your team leadership, whether it's in empathy and communication. You, every day you should be able to look back and reflect on what did I do today and how am I a better leader than I was yesterday? And they can be really, really small gains as long as there's some forward progress, as long as you're leaning forward in your in your leadership. So, okay. And then if the second tool, excuse me, the second leg of the stool is about navigating ambiguity. We've, we've worked on the, the mindset. We've worked on the learning what we can and can't control, getting clear on that before moving forward. Um, where is the, nobody likes ambiguity. So what would you say is the, uh, the, the key tenant to being able to do it? I mean, when we're talking about ambiguity in the role, in the context of leadership, what does that mean to people? Not knowing where your supply chain is going next, not knowing if you're going to be able to retain your talent in a crazy market like it was for the last year and a half before the last few months, um, not the regulatory risk, political risk, uh, cultural risk, social risk, being comfortable with the fact in putting your ego aside and saying, there's all these variables that I don't know the, the answer to. What do I know and how can I minimize risk going forward based on what I can control? And it all comes down to resilience. I mean, I define an optimist as someone who wakes up every day, not saying it's going to be a great day, but waking up and saying a lot of stuff's going to go wrong, right? <laughs> but but I'm going to be okay because I have the tools and capacity and leadership track record that I know I'm going to be okay and the people that I'm responsible for are going to be okay. So the first thing is building resilience to get a higher tolerance for ambiguity. The second thing is learning to lean in when you don't know all the answers and not being afraid uh, of telling people you don't have all the answers, shifting from a reactive to a proactive mindset. And the number one principle there is, whether it's Dostoevsky or Jordan Peterson, don't lie to yourself. Tell the truth, most importantly, every day to yourself, and then sit down and do what everyone should be doing. Make a list of what matters most, and then how do you address those things before anyone else? So getting comfortable, being uncomfortable, and you can practice that and build that in a number of ways, personally and professionally. But once your mindset shifts from, I'm being threatened, to this is chaos, this is an opportunity, you are 99 times ahead of, of anyone else who is still sitting there wondering if their business is going to survive. Once you know that you're going to survive, how the degree to which you thrive is variable based on a whole bunch of things in and out of your control. But um, getting comfortable with living in a sea of ambiguity is paramount because, well, you know, since 2020, COVID, lockdowns, remote work, health, financial scarcity mindset, social issues riots, societal breakdown for the first time in a generation. After that, supply chain, no toilet paper on shelves, talents fleeing everywhere for double their salary. It's just like there's a there's a rolling wave of, of shock waves after 2020. 
It's not going to stop anytime soon. In the last three weeks, people thought we'd have a nice spring reprieve and like things would go back to normal. It's like bank failures, rate hikes, political risk, all these things going on. Um, war still, you know, NATO members jumping in to a war that we haven't fully committed to yet. Um, it's so all in all of, of this, yeah, it, with so before we go down the rabbit hole of like, let's figure out how many more really depressing topics we can bring up. <laughs> In, in one 14 second strip, the I want to go actually to focus on a phrase that you went past real quickly, but I think it was key here. You referenced a key shift mm -hmm. in going from A to B. Can yes. you uh, boil that down for us one more time? Let's let's repeat it and let's dissect it. Moving from a reactive to a proactive mindset having enough emotional relief and confidence in your ability to make good decisions that you can start leaning in to solving problems or at least stating problems for what they are without your stakeholders freaking out, right? Um, the moment that you walk into a chaotic situation, you wake up at 3 a.m., your phone's buzzing because a hurricane hit your seaport where all your merchandise is coming in for the first time in three months. Um, it's, it's, it's leaning in and saying, okay, there's going to be an opportunity in this somewhere. What is it? And what do I have to do in order to just make sure that all of my stakeholders, my employees, my customers, whatever it might be, people in my supply chain have what they need to be safe and effective and do their job. But the first part of leaning into a proactive mindset is that confidence that comes from knowing in your head, you're going to be okay, because you know, your own story, you know, you, you, you look, you look at yourself as a stakeholder, because if you speak to what your what your goals are, and you record it, would you listen to yourself and would you believe yourself as being confident in somebody that people should follow? A lot of times, no. So what do you need to do in order to shore up that story with good data, good facts, um, which we'll talk about in the storytelling for stakeholders portion. But um, all that boils down to, you know, shockwave, I'm a little bit, you know, uh, off, off kilter and then leaning right in. It's, it's kids that learn how to fight, you know, as a young kid, whether it's jujitsu or boxing, it's like you punch me in the face now we're in it, you know, like, like the, the battles here where I'm standing. It's like one of my favorite quotes. I, I have fortunate to have a lot of friends in the special operations community. And one of them uh, was asked about in an interview somewhere about, you know, when you're in a cave or in the desert or somewhere so far away from America, how do you, how do you keep that mindset of I'm here defending America? And he said, I'm an American whatever patch of land I'm standing on becomes a little piece of America. And that's what I'm defending. Wherever I am is where my home and my mission and my ideology and philosophy is. Same thing with business. You know, you're in a boardroom taking it from all ends. At the moment, you're still in charge. Like you still have your job. Like you're still the leader they're all looking to for answers. So how are you going to get back into that proactive mindset and still confidence in them by saying, these are all the unknowns, but the things that we, that we do know, we're going to totally take control of those and be able to minimize risk and even maybe take some opportunities there. So, yeah. Okay. So with all of the mindset shift and all that shifting from the reactive to the proactive, we've, we're in the right place mentally. Now it's time to take what we know, what we believe, what we feel and get others to get it, get yep. others to accept our vision, to advise us as we want and to get on board, to, to create, to control that narrative. So, Let's dive into more of the details about stakeholder storytelling, because this is, I think, is really where your uh, your your particular expertise is. Give us a couple of first tips for a good story. First tips for a good story are to learn basic story structure. There's a million ways to tell a story. There's only a few ways traditionally to tell a really, really good or great story. Right. Um, people will reference hero's journey for Joseph Campbell. People will reference Virgin's promise for the feminine uh, hero archetype, whatever it might be. But at a minimum, there's three basic points to a story. Whoever the protagonist is, your hero, reluctant or not willing, um, has to call to action. They, they go out in some adventure. They experience a whole lot of challenges and failures, but they get some unique treasure that only they, they, they received because they went through these trials and tribulations, their crisis. And they go back out in the world and they don't just monetize it or you know turn into gold for themselves. They share it. So a good story has a protagonist that goes on an adventure, wanders out into the world, suffers, and then returns to the world and shares their treasure. 
Um, and that could be for your customers, for your team, for your stakeholders, for your board, for your analysts who are going to you know, be listening to your quarterly earnings call, whatever it might be. So understand, understanding basic story structure is the number one point of a good story and knowing who your audience is, not just talking to the world by saying, oh, they should get it because this makes sense. This is a great product, better algorithm, whatever. But understanding who your stakeholders are and how they like to be spoken to and how they're going to receive your information the best way because different people communicate differently. Um, and then understanding that a good story will eventually fade if it's not backed by concrete data that supports your story as a thesis over time. Um, what is the and, relationship between data and I mean, how much data do you use versus how much story? Because I think that's something that people tend to err on one side or the other. But uh, is it is it context dependent or is there a general formula where if you're going to tell a story, you got to back up this much data or if you're going to share this much data, at what point do you need a story in it to to bring it to life of sorts? It's context dependent to the point where if I'm talking to a bunch of analysts or engineers, they want to hear about the data that supports this like great new groundbreaking disruptive product we're going to do. If I'm talking to customers or people who aren't technical, they're going to want to hear if they're a part of this hero's journey or heroine's journey they're going on, how is their life going to be, you know, better as a through business, through whatever it might be, if they if you are successful in this. Um, and uh, the the storytelling exercises that I do with large brands are intense six month, nine month processes for many different internal and external stakeholders, all identified separately for their needs and value props. But the point is those three data points I mentioned for a really good story as a basic uh, framework, there's 60 or 70 data points on my maps. So we pull out for high level conversations, a podcast interview, whatever it might be, a, a panel they're on, what I call the wow stats. Everybody should know their wow stats, whether it's revenue or productivity or scale or market um, uh, um, percentage of market you have. Everybody has wow stats. You have them personally. You know, I did this as a kid. I was an athlete or I was this or I went to the Junior Olympics. Like whatever it must be, it might be. You have wow stats. Those, those are the core foundation, the most common denominator of of your data related to a story. But over time, depending on your different stakeholder groups and who you're talking to, you need to know, do I need to learn more, be more heavily on data or more heavily on narrative? Like, is it more of an emotional uh, a win that I need than saying, you know, oh, you know, we were able to get our customer acquisition costs down to $100 per, per user. So if you give us $10 million now, we're going to go get X number of users, as opposed to we're starting out and we see this massive opportunity in the market and we think that we can win because... These are the people that are leading you with our experience. These are the customers telling us that there's a gap in the market and if we would only fill it. More of an emotional versus having the actual raw data. Yes, yes. I, I like the idea of the wow stats. The um, It's funny, there was like three questions all came into my mind as you were talking and then they all summarily exited right afterwards. But... Oh, I was hoping you were writing them down. <laughs> I was writing a lot of stuff down. There's all sorts of great stuff here. The um, With regard to the delivery and the the voice of authority. Oh, I know what it was. Okay, this is what also we'll come back to that voice piece in a second. But the hero's journey. I mean, I've mentioned it once or twice. I think it's becoming a little bit more commonly recognized as a as a construct, but for those out there who don't know and correct me if my understanding is wrong, I think the biggest misconception in telling a hero's journey story is the the belief that you need to frame yourself as the hero somehow and or your company as the hero saving others, that that's the value that you're providing, where in reality, the hero's journey is about framing yourself not as the hero, but as the guide. If you're going to use the, the Star Wars example, it's not about framing yourself as Luke. Uh, it's about framing yourself as Yoda and how you help Luke and the client that you're helping or the industry or the whoever it is that it, the people that are that person, that's the client you're save that you're helping to save the world or to save the industry or to save the whatever it is. It's what is your role in empowering others? That's how you save the day per se. You're not the hero. You're the guide. That's the the power of the story. Is my understanding the same as yours? Uh, it, it goes a little bit both ways. So in traditional okay. hero's journey, Yoda would be the mentor that they meet on the first leg. And, and Luke is the hero, but he's only a hero, not because he goes through all these things, but because in the end, the treasure, the unique value that he has that nobody else has, frees the resistance, frees all these people. Like your stakeholders are the true heroes in the story. 
right? And, and they, you could both be heroes, but your stakeholders and their needs and their stakeholders, second degree, if you're a CMO or if you're someone who isn't the, the ultimate leader of an organization, your, your CEO should be your main stakeholder. What do you need to deliver to he or she so that they can win? But who are their stakeholders? How are they going to communicate those wins to the board or to analysts or an interview or whatever it might be? So the hero is the person that takes part in the journey, but it's, it's equally sometimes more your actual customers, your stakeholders, whoever it might be, because the value of your treasure going back to live in a cave and saying, I'm a Jedi Knight, that means nothing unless you can go change people's lives and worldview and perspective to a definite before and after. There was a before Luke Skywalker came into our lives and an after Luke Skywalker came into our lives, right? Sure. And, yes. And, there, and there's a not male and female sex wise, but a feminine and masculine version of that where the hero's journey traditionally is an external journey. You're going to go out and slay a drag and you're going to go out and build a business and be, make all this money and come share it with whatever. Whereas the feminine version of that is the internal resistance they overcome. I overcome, you know, the, the, the lack of confidence I have. I overcome, you know, uh, not believing I can do X, Y, Z, but then doing it and changing the relationship with all of the stakeholders and dependents outside. And the perfect stories now being woven are a perfect mix of those two. So you don't just have to tell a story of we're going to go build this great product, a flying car, and all your lives are going to be be better. But like, why? Like, what is the internal struggle that most people have because their cars don't fly? Like, what, what, you know, what problem are you solving? Um, so I think it's really important to, to make sure everybody heard that clearly, that while there are, when we're talking about archetypal storylines of sorts, heroes, journeys, the 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 template of sorts or the historical direction are uh broadly labeled as the feminine versus the masculine but it's not mm -hmm. this is what women do this is what men do where those labels came from you know is up for debate on somebody else's podcast but we're just looking yeah. at the fact and as you mentioned if i heard you correctly that really the 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 most powerful and most effective stories, whether told by a woman, by a male, by a mixed team, or by anybody else, are incorporating elements of both the internal struggle and the external struggle. Yes? Hundred percent. Yes. And if you read a thirty-page shareholder letter that Jamie Dimon does, he does it perfectly. Whether he's doing an interview from some Detroit JP community Morgan. bank, yeah, Jamie Dimon weaves them both in exceptionally, and he comes off as empathetic and compassionate, but also delivering the fa facts and the data, and that he's he has the capacity and the tools that are usually associated with the hero's journey that he went out and, and, and got in order to help you. So, um, yeah, without going too much down the rabbit hole, I know we're time constrained, but um, the the weaving of both of those narratives uh, uh, and archetypes is the most successful way to tell a story, especially in the new zero, in the new environment, because for the first time in a generation, everybody suffered internally. Everybody was locked in their house or couldn't go grocery shopping, was afraid that their grandmother was going to get sneezed on and die or whatever it might be. Um, like there was a fear of physical security, health security, financial security, you know, and so everybody went through it. So if you're a brand communicating, you don't have to communicate fear. You don't want fear-based marketing or, or communication, but the internal struggles that people went through the last three years, that's why they're overwhelmingly responding to things like the resurgence of comedy since I was a kid. When I was a kid, it was always a comedy special every week on HBO. And then, you know, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, nothing. But now the biggest stars in the world, some of them have a Netflix special out every month or, or podcast. It's like people need emotional relief and then they need someone to reframe the world through a filter of clarity. And that's where pr pragmatic optimism that we, we spoke about the last time comes in. And in, whether you're telling that story in a Netflix special, in a weekend HBO 1990s comedy special, or in a board meeting at this point, you you reference the voice of authority. And I don't want to let yeah. that one slide. So when you talk about the voice of authority, what does that mean to you? That there is no question in your mind, you have almost an, an irrational belief in yourself that you are the person that that belongs in that seat to have that title and delivering this message to those stakeholders. You need to know internally that these people, customers, board, employees, that they're best off if you're in charge, right? So when you talk about that voice of authority, sometimes it's your actual literal voice. I prefer people to you for executive presence, how you come across as strong. You might be delivering strong data, but it might not come across as that. So, um, you know, knowing that you are speaking in a voice of authority that is backed by data, that your confidence isn't false, you're not lying to people, right? And then, and then having a way to measure 
did they hear what you're telling them? Like, are they respecting your authority? And are they are they up for this ride? Because it's going to be bumpy. There's a whole bunch. You just told them eight of the 10 things we need to know. Nobody knows right now. <laughs> so, you know, do they say, okay, this, this is our leader and we're following this guy or this gal in the battle. And um, I tell folks all the time with relation to the, the women that I coach versus the men that I coach, um, tough as nails. Like I'd follow any of those women in the battle, you know, because I've seen them go from, and they have both sides, really empathetic, compassionate leaders or teams love them. But when it's time to be a killer, you're, you're you know, like it's, you know, you're, you're in it. Um, and it happens because you comes from all sides. You have regulators, media, customers hijacking your brand because you didn't address a certain issue the right way. You could have spent $30 million on a Super Bowl commercial. Boom. Now everybody hates you. Like, <laughs> how do you how do you get control back of your narrative is is as important as knowing what narrative that you need to share from the first from the first place. And that, and that's, there, that's I, I heard a lot of the challenge in there, and I would imagine the question many people will ask, and this will be my final question for you today, is yeah. how do you where's the fine line between that kind of confidence that you just described of being absolutely certain that you are the one who is meant to be there, that you can do this, you have what it takes, and that you're going to lead the hero, lead the company, lead the whoever, whatever literal or figurative term you want to victory. For those who are like, well, that sounds kind of arrogant. Where's that line between confidence and arrogance versus does that mean I'm not supposed to feel any fear at all? Does that mean that I shouldn't feel any anxiety? Am I lying to myself? Is it that fake it till you make it kind of thing? Where? How does all that reconcile? Everybody's always a little bit afraid and that's natural. And Tony Blower is one of the foremost experts on fear and uh, psychology that I'm a fan of and one of his coaches. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the balance is not 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 tracking your own performance and and like we talked about before like consistently performing better every day and tracking that knowing that you're doing the work to go to go um promote that authority and, and it might come across as arrogant for a little bit that's okay but if you don't have the actual skill set to back it up it's going to last for a day or two and people say this guy or gal has no idea like where they're leading us just leading us into the wilderness so you need to have the confidence but it's got to be bit backed up by your skill sets David Fincher, who's a famous uh, director, directed Seven and all these movies, he was a commercial director before that. And a, and a uh, reporter asked him when um, the Oscars came around, how'd you go from directing like a, a hundred man crew for a commercial for 60 seconds to an hour and a half movie for Oscar nominations with a thousand, you know, post and production people. And he said that the sad truth is that most people beg to be led. And if you talk loud enough with enough authority and have just some vision, some point to where you're pointing them, they will follow you, you know, but along the way, they need to be reassured that you're marking the right milestones for success and tracking it so that they know they're performing. So that's the balance. You know, you don't have to walk in like Steve Jobs, like a maniac and screaming at people, but you need to know that, that the confidence is backed by the real stuff, you know, um, yes. like Stephen Pressfield has a great quote, you know, uh, warriors fight scared and athletes play hurt. Like everybody's scared, everybody's hurt, right? Uh, especially yeah. in a crisis. So what are you going to do? And you can't go out to your board or your customers and say, everything's going to be great. And then go home and cry and need a bucket of ice cream every night. You need to be <laughs> home, you need to be home working on your skill sets and honing them, your communication skills, your performance, all that stuff. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. You can be as forward leaning and as loud as you want, but when it comes down to it, you need to be able to make the sausage with, you know, the ingredients of the sausage. Yeah. yeah. Well, vegan or otherwise, we vegan nobody wants to know how the sausage is made. But if you're going to lead, you're going to have to find out what the recipe is. Uh, so I think I heard two really key important parts there. Number one is that, and a phrase that I've heard certainly is that uh, courage is not the same as fearlessness. Mm -hmm. Courage is feeling the fear and doing it anyway. And I yeah. think that's that's what uh, a summary of what I understood you to say is finding that balance. Um, and while you can't go home and eat a bucket of ice cream every night, we still have ice cream. And I think you deserve some yeah. when you've done well. But, but, but you need a space to freak out, whether it's with your coach, your therapist, your loved one at the end of the day. Everybody's going to break down at some point, but you need to be able to minimize that and say, I let the emotion out. I let out all the ambiguity to myself. I said it out loud. Now I get back to work. Yes. And then, then that allows you to project authority because you need to also come across as human. And I told people, I had two weeks at the beginning of COVID. I cried and ate ice cream every day. And I was like, I'm alone in my house. My dog walkers won't even come over. I haven't been seen another, another human being in 15 days. And then you wake up and you're like, all right, bro, I've been through it before. 
Like, what are you going to do? You know, and then yes. you set up a plan, you make a list and you start tracking your performance every day, whether it's health, wellness, work, you know, uh, and you just do the work to quote Stephen Pressfield. Like there's yes. no secret, there's no secret. You wake up, you do the work. So yep. And you can, so I like the idea of just compartmentalizing to an extent, yes, go whatever anxieties, whatever fears, whatever, address them, acknowledge them, get it out of your system for the moment, and then go back into battle and do the, what you need to do. The same as you reward yourself. I had a successful speech, whatever it might be. I'm going to buy myself a fountain pen or a new suit. I got through the day. I got through the week. All my stakeholders are still working towards our goal. I'm going to go cry to my therapist for an hour. Like, like that. that's my, my, my reward, you know? So it's always reward-based and there's nothing negative about it, but- you are a human that goes back to the top of the half hour theme about undercover boss. You're a person, you're not a robot and you're leading people. You aren't leading robots yet. You know, we're not all, you know, an army of chatbots working for it. Um, yep. So yeah, hopefully that answers the question in a satisfactory way. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Tons of great information, Damon. I know we could go way, way deep on any of these areas. Um, I love anything regarding storytelling and uh, finding your voice. You got to find it and finding that balance, uh, you know, internal and external, projecting the authority that you and everybody else needs to know that you have, because otherwise you don't belong there. But it's still about just fighting the battles every day. No one's 100 percent confidence. It's just confident that you're going to fight your way through it and make it happen. You're going to find that solution. I think that's terrific. So how can people learn more about you? They can find me on LinkedIn, which is the great uh, number one place for me to connect professionally. And my my website is legacymentor.co. And I will give you to provide a link in the show notes, an excerpt from the book that I'm working on about pragmatic optimism, about how to stop that fear loop and to start leaning forward and having a, a clear picture, a realistic picture of the challenges around you, but learning to be optimistic in that in that new way of seeing the world. Like, you know, you need to be pragmatic, but also find a way to be optimistic. So I'll send you a link to that uh, to that book excerpt. Right. So uh, and we'll have that in the show notes. Everybody can check it out and get those uh, couple of chapters from as a sneak preview of Damon's upcoming book. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a lot of fun, Damon. Thanks so much. And to everybody else out there, as always, thank you for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And please don't forget, give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice so we can help even more people to increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, of course, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations for virtual influence, including my picks for microphones, lights, and more, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.